Hey fifth grade, it's Mrs. Daly, and I hope you're doing really well. I miss you so much, and I wanted to make some videos to um, keep your brains thinking and um, your skills up. So I'm going to start off with a read aloud, and I don't know how far I'll get in it today, but I will let you know um, what part of the book we're reading, and if you want to keep a journal about what questions you're wondering, or if there's something that you are curious about, you can leave a comment, let me know any questions you have. So um, I'm going to start off, let's do some rainbow breaths and you're going to reach as tall as you can. Stretch. Okay, take a deep breath in. Push it out. Deep breath in. Then push it out. All right. Um, so the book I selected for us to read first, I'm so excited about. It's called The Keeping Room, and it's by Anna Myers. It is fantastic. So here's the summary blurb on the back. The war has come home. When Colonel Joseph Kershaw leaves Camden, South Carolina, to lead the American rebels in their struggle against the British, he leaves his son behind as the man of the house to fight the enemy on his own home turf. But what can a 13-year-old boy do when General Cornwallis and his troops come into town and make the Kershaw's home their headquarters and begin hanging American prisoners in the family garden? Joey is determined to get revenge, even if he has to risk everything. So it's a fantastic book. I am so excited to be able to share it with you. And um, let's get into it. So here we go. Right. So chapter one. My father's troops wait on their horses just outside our front door. I can hear the murmuring voices of the men and the snorts and pawings of their mounts, anxious to be down the road to meet the enemy. You can't go, Joseph, my mother says, and she makes a wide movement with her arm to indicate the stairway to the front hall of our new home. There's no railing to hold on to. She takes my father's hand and leads him to the stairs. Will you not stay long enough to see to a railing? My dear, he begins, but my mother pulls away, drops to the second stair, and begins to cry. Let the house girls walk up and down with the small ones, my father says, but my mother's tears do not stop. I must go. He bends and kisses her on top of the head. She does not look up. My mother cries. I know, not because of the stairs, but because she is afraid. I want to comfort her, but there is no time. My father's boots sound loud on the polished planks of our fine oak floors. He's going away. I trot behind him as he crosses the wide hall and catch him just at the door. We step together into the sunlight. I think perhaps he's not noticed me beside him. I put out my hand to touch his coat sleeve, but I do not. Why do you think he doesn't touch his coat sleeve? Like what's holding him back? Hmm. Instead, I bite at my lip to hold back the question. I long to hurl his way. Questions about his return, about what might lie ahead if he does meet the enemy, and most of all, about how a frightened boy might borrow his father's courage. He is, to my relief, aware of my presence. Just before he begins the long stride down the porch steps, he stops, put a hand on my shoulder, and speaks. Stand tall, my boy, he says to me. I shield my eyes because looking at him means staring into the sun. Remember all I have taught you. Be brave and strong. There will be ways you can help the men of town fight should it fall out of my men and I do not stop the bloody British for one long moment he looks only at me he turns then to face his men gentlemen he calls meet my son I take one step forward and make a sweeping bow he is left to guard the family in our home my father says they clap there are whoops of approval I'm embarrassed red of face but I'm also proud. So if you could think of responsibilities for guarding the home, what do you think he's gonna have to do? What would you have to do to guard your home or be in charge of things if you're gonna step up and help your families do more? My father glances once more briefly into my eyes. I have no wish to say goodbye, but he seems to expect something from me. So I whisper, I swear father to do just as you've told me. He nods, then he's gone. Only the pounding of the horse's hooves is left to me. I stand on the great porch watching the dust settle behind the troops and feeling very small. 
I rub at my eyes, which have been strained by the brightness of the sun and of my father. I would like to slip away to the creek, maybe even tramp along through the swamp till I reach the river. Mother would complain that I ruined my shoes on such treks, but for a while I could forget about my father having gone to war. I move to the veranda rail and stare towards the water. A great white bird glides above the pine trees. I want to lose myself in the soft dampness of the green world, but my teacher is waiting for me. I turn back into the house and down the stairs to the keeping room. It's a well-filled larder now. So larder is like where you keep all your stuff, your um, supplies, kind of like a pantry what we would use. But only days ago, when we were just moving into our new home, the keeping room was empty. Cato supervised the stocking, calling directions to the other slaves. Rice, go here. There, go flour. Next shelf, cornmeal. George and Sarah, my small brother and sister, dashed about that day, sniffing the stores of tea and coffee. A taste of sugar, please. Sarah pulled at the leg of my trousers. I did not hear her at first because I was lost in thought, wondering if the provisions would be for us or for the British. My father has told me the army will be stopped before they reach our town of Camden. I tell myself that my father is always right. I am, after all, my father's son, named for him, though the third son to be born. My older brothers, James and John, are at school now in England. My mother is glad. Were they here, she says, they too would be off to war. I pity my older brothers, forced to live among people who willingly bow to King George. So I know that this is a little bit ahead of where we got in our history class, but at this point, um, remember after the French and Indian War, we were talking about how they owed a whole bunch of money, and so the British are going to find a way to try to get that money back, and one of the ways is to raise taxes, so the colonists, for, for a couple other reasons as well, but one of the main reasons is going to be that they get really frustrated that they're trying to take their money away from them with taxes, and um, now they're going to be trying to fight back. So we're kind of a little ahead of where we studied, but I'll give you guys more information later. Both of my older brothers and my younger sisters are like mother's family, light of skin and hair. Only my little brother and I are not fair. And I am told that father was pleased at my birth to observe that I appeared more like him. I'm like him still with thick dark hair and skin so brown in summer that I might be mistaken for one of the Catawas, the native tribe that lives in this part of South Carolina. My brothers chose early professions, chose their professions early. James Law and John Medicine. My father does not seem to mind that they're not interested in his business since I will take my father's place. I'm often at his side because he runs those enterprises. Such activity pleases me. It pleases me, too, that I'm educated at home. Because my mother's people are Quakers, she has chosen Yuvin Wiley, also of that faith, as my teacher. So I'm going to take a second and try to remember what do you know about Quakers. If you have paper, jot it down. What do we know about Quakers? So hopefully, coming to mind is going to be that they don't like war. So we know that they're having war and the Quakers don't want a part of a war. Hopefully you're thinking back to when we read Witch of Blackbird Pond together and you're thinking about Hannah Tupper as a Quaker. Um, so it's, what does that tell us about this wife? You might be thinking about that. Once I thought Ewan quite wise, though he is still a young man, I no longer feel so. Ewan says there should be no war with England. He says if we Americans would be but patient, we would in the years to come outgrow the mother country and become a nation without a fight. My father scoffs at Ewan's ideas. The soldiers are gone, are they? Ewan is at the great keeping room table. He does not look up at me. His eyes are fixed upon a piece of wood that he's carving. Tis foolish for men to kill one another. He stops whittling at the pine he is transforming into Jesus and the little children called unto him. Ewan touches the head of the wooden figure. Death comes soon enough for us all. I'm disgusted with Ewan because his religion has made him weak. Why do you imagine our Lord looked so? I question, and I point to his carving. You've never seen him, I'll wager. I'd like a good argument, but Ewan only smiles. I flop into a chair and open a book, but the lessons do not penetrate my brain. I imagine that I'm composing a letter. Dear Father, I'm afraid. Have you ever been afraid? Tell me about how to make my heart stop pounding. Suddenly, I'm aware of Ewan's voice. Thee might find solace in writing down of thy thoughts, perhaps in a letter to thy father. I stare at him. This has happened before, this seemingly reading of my mind, and I find it irritating. There'd be no way to send 
a letter to my father, I say, and I flip the pages of my book. Thee could be most honest in a letter never meant to be sent, could thee not? Ewan smiles. It must not be an easy thing for thee, being the son of a great man. Father has been gone six days now. A hush hangs over our home as we go quietly about our daily duties. My mother struggles to be brave. She is often at prayer or in conversation with Biddy, the slave who is also her friend. We must honor your father with our bravery, she says, and there have been no more visible tears since the day of his departure. Yet I've heard her crying at night. My sister Mary no longer plays on the pianoforte, which father gave her upon her last birthday. Even George and Sarah, who are but five and three years of age, seem to have some understanding of what is happening. They do not run and laugh as usual. Only baby Rebecca is completely spared and goes waddling about the nursery with thick rolls of soft cotton. We call her pudding around her waist and head so that she is protected from falls. If only we could all have pudding. All right, so that is the first chapter. Um, what do we know about our main character? Hmm. What do we know about his dad and his wife or his mother? Um, take a moment and jot down what do we know about them or um, say them out loud. And what do you think? Do you think that um, his tutor is weak for believing not to have war? Or do you think that there's something strong about that? So something to think about. Um, I'm going to try to chunk these videos by chapter so that if you need a break, we can do that. So I'm going to end this video and I will start reading chapter two. So I guess I'll see you guys in the next video and um, I hope everything's well with you guys. I miss you so much. Bye.